Lord God, uh, now at this time, Lord, we just pray that as we just sang, Lord, we would turn our eyes to you. God, let us fix our gaze on your goodness, your holiness. Lord, all that you are. And God, help us just come to know you and love you deeper uh, through your word, Lord. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Ancient tradition tells us that when the Apostle John was nearing the end of his life, his voice grew weak. So weak that ultimately he had to stop preaching there in Ephesus. Yet each Sunday up until this time, his message every single Sunday was the same thing. And it was simply this, love one another. So John preaching this same message over and over, and if you've been with us during this sermon series, you know that John repeats himself quite a bit. And one of the major themes we've seen is love, but... Up until he couldn't anymore, his, his message was love, love, love. Finally, the congregation grew somewhat frustrated that they would come and hear the same message every Sunday. And finally, somebody was bold enough to say, Pastor John, why do you keep telling us the same thing over and over and over? To which John replied, as it's been passed down, I say what I say because it is the Lord's command. And if this is all you do, it is enough. Think about that for a second. If, if all we do is love one another from because we're loving God. Remember that the greatest commandment is love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So if we're able to love others, that means we're loving God and loving our neighbor as ourself. And if that's all we do, that's enough. Love, obviously, has been a foundational theme throughout the book of 1 John. And this morning we're going to flip and, and look at another foundational theme that has been running with this idea of love. And we're going to look at the theme of faith this morning. The message of faith, like love, is one that should be repeated throughout our churches from now until Christ comes back. Faith and love. Faith and love. Faith and love. Because you really can't love God and love others without faith in Christ. So we're going to see that this morning as we talk about this major theme of faith. And we know this, and I've quoted this often here, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So for us to have true, biblical, saving faith, it must come from hearing the true Word of God. Amen? This morning we're going to look at the nature of our faith as John lays it out for us in the first several verses of chapter 5. So if you've got your Bibles open, 1 John chapter 5, we're going to go ahead and read the first 12 verses here of chapter 5. And then next week we're going to sadly finish this book up. And, and go into something different. But this morning, let's see what the Word of the Lord has for us through these first 12, chapter, 12 verses of chapter 5. The Bible says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. By this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burden, burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is He who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that He has been born concerning His Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God 
has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony that God gave us, eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. So as we begin to unpack unpack this idea of Christian faith, I believe it's important for us to see the nature of Christian faith. What all is involved in the faith that we as believers possess. So we're going to see three things in the nature of Christian faith. Number one, the object of our faith. Number two, we're going to see the author of faith. And thirdly, we'll see the effects of faith. So first off, Christian faith has to begin with an object, and it's no secret here. I'm sure we could all say who the object of our faith is. Do we want to give it a go? Jesus. So Jesus is the object of our faith. This Jesus Christ that the Bible says is the divine Son of God. The Jesus that came and dwelt among us that lived a sinless and perfect life, that came to shed his blood so that man could be reconciled to God. The righteous one, the Bible says. The one who intercedes on our behalf of those that are true Christians, those that possess this saving faith. The one we have joyful fellowship with. If you're not having joyful fellowship with Christ, you may be serving the wrong one. Because Jesus should bring us a joyful fellowship. Even in the midst of our worst suffering, there should be joy in Christ. But we see that this is the object of our faith, this Jesus Christ that the Bible teaches us about. Now many people will have faith, and many of you have probably heard somebody say something, well I have faith in God because I heard some preacher preach about things and my emotions were stirred and my feelings were stirred and I just felt really good and something just came over me. So I have faith in God. Listen, that is not Christian faith. If you say you have faith in God because an emotion that was conjured up inside of you, that is not true Christian faith. That faith is meaningless. It's useless. It's worthless. Faith is meaningless unless it is rooted in the belief that Jesus Christ has been born of God. Is what John says in verse 1, that everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him, which is Jesus Christ. The Christian faith begins with this object. Again, it's not a feeling, it's not an emotion, it's not some crazy or interesting thing that happened to you as a result of going to church one day or turning on your radio or TV. The object of our faith is Christ alone. The second part of this faith is the author of faith. So we have an object, which is Jesus, but who is the author of faith? In other words, where does this faith come from? Now, I know that some of this may be very Um, common things that we're talking about this morning, but uh, sometimes we need to go back to the basics. Amen? Who is the author of our faith? Where does this faith come from? Many people will say this, well, faith comes from me. I I have the faith in Christ. I have faith. But faith comes from God. Now, You can say, I have faith that this chair I'm sitting in is going to hold me. Maybe that's the faith that you've conjured up and believe and hold to. But when it comes to a true, saving faith in all of Christianity, the faith that you possess in Christ does not come from you. It comes from God Himself. And we'll see here in just a second... And I'm going to show you a passage of Scripture that backs this claim up, that this faith you possess comes from God and not you. Now, let's think about a baby. We got some babies in here. Some of, a, some of those babies are six months old or less. Some of those babies are 32 years old or somewhere along in there. But let's think about a baby. 
a baby learns how to crawl, well, scoot, crawl, walk, talk. A baby's going to grow up and learn all sorts of things, aren't they? And it's all a result of one event in their life. Without this one event, none of it would ever happen. Does anybody want to take a guess of what this one event would, would be? The birth, right? So if a baby is never birthed, it never learns how to walk, talk, scoot, crawl, get on your nerves, and all those things, right? So all of these things that we even do now as me, 37, and you, however old you are, is a result of that one event in your life. It's your physical birth. So let's think of the belief that you have in Christ. The belief that you have, it all comes from one event too, much like a baby in its physical birth. The belief that you have in Christ, that you continue to have in Christ, comes from one huge event in your life as well. Does anybody want to take a guess at that one? Salvation, which is the new birth, the spiritual birth. So your belief in Christ without a spiritual birth would not exist. And how many of you would say that you birthed yourself? Any of us birthing ourselves in here? No, nobody's physically. We didn't say, hey, I'm creating myself into existence in my mother's womb. I'm going to choose when. I'm going to knock that thing out. I'm coming. Or that, you know, the water and all that stuff. Like it's on a tight, like the baby can do it. Like here I come. <laughs> right? You're on my watch. No. Even a physical birth, God is in complete control of. God places the baby in the womb. God causes it to grow. God determines when the water breaks and the women are like, it's time, right? God is all in control of every single millisecond of that happening. Just like he is our spiritual birth. Because we can't birth ourselves spiritually either. And again, we'll see this. Nicodemus Many of you know the story of Nicodemus and his con conversation with Jesus. He had heard no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born again. And, you know, the, he, can one go into his mother's womb and be born again? No, that's not what is happening here. We're talking about a spiritual birth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless being born again. And, and, for, and John says in 1 John 5, 1, he uses the phrase born of God. This means that anyone born of God has been born from above. When you begin to research and study this out, this being born again means to be born from above, not from the inward parts of your being. You see, salvation or this regeneration happens as a result of God producing this spiritual birth in you, not you producing it on your own. We've talked about this over and over. The Bible says that we are hostile to God. We are enemies before we are saved. We care nothing about the things of God. Romans chapter 3 teaches us that we, we pretty much shake our fist at God and we're calling Him out on the battlefield. We're at war. And we would stay that way if not for God's grace. If not for God's grace, we would continually grind our teeth and call him out on the battlefield and say, come on, I hate you, I want no part of you, I'm at war with you. That's the state of man from birth. Our physical birth produces a sinful nature, a war with our Creator. And we would remain that way if not for grace. God is the author of faith and gives the gift of faith to those that he saves. So believers are born again or born from above. We also know this as regeneration. I prayed this this morning is when the Spirit takes out this heart of stone and puts in a heart of flesh that you begin to hear the gospel, understand the gospel, understand your need for a savior because you are so sinful. And when we are born again, we're given the gift of faith and of course we place this faith in the object which is again 
Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Now, there have been many tactics used over the years to try to get people to come into a saving faith. Some of us have used these tactics, right? There's a lot of things that go on that we try to just, just place your faith in him right now. All you got to do is place your faith in him. Just do it. Well, how does one place their faith in something that we're hostile with? Why would I place my faith into somebody that's trying to be at odds with me and I at odds with them? We want no part of it, do we? We can't. So we try to just, just believe, just believe. Now, yes, we call you to repentance and faith, but we understand here that it's God that does that. It's the Spirit at work that does that. Because if I could make you have faith, I would. <laughs> and I know that Josh would make you have faith. And Ryan, and Allie, and Chris. everybody in here that would love to see everybody saved would say, this is all you got to do. But we can't. We can't do it on our own. Many people have used the tactics, just repeat this prayer after me, and you'll have faith and be saved. Many people will say, all you got to do is slip your hand up. Melissa, I see that hand. She jokes all the time with me about that. Raising your hand in church at the end of a sermon does not give you true Christian faith. Repeating a prayer, and I know, I, I probably sound like John now. Y'all, you've told us this over and over, preacher. Yes, it's important for us to understand. Walking an aisle, repeating a prayer, thinking it's some magical thing we're doing inside, that does not give us saving faith. As I was studying through this and reading some things, I came across a story of a man that they were growing up, and there was a, a family friend over at the house. So it was his sister's best friend, but a collective family friend. So he was like, man, this girl needs to be saved. So I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to just focus on her. I'm going to lay the gospel before her. I'm going to hope that she repents of her sin and trusts Christ. I hope she places her faith in Jesus. I'm just going to go in here. So he goes in there. His sister's in there, this girl's in there, and he's just laboring over the gospel, just teaching the gospel and putting it out there and just biblically telling her that she's a sinner in need of a savior. And yet she seems uninterested and unmoved, and, and, and he's also dealing with his sister, kind of distracting. She's almost acting like she's not even listening or paying attention, kind of be, seemingly being rude even. Like he's thinking, I'm trying to teach the gospel to her, but you won't shut up and stop moving and making noise, right? So he tries to ignore his sister, and he just gets back onto the gospel with this, with this girl, and, 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 and sh nothing changes in her heart. Nothing changes in her life. There's no faith, and he kind of feels defeated. A few days later, his sister comes to him and said, I need to tell you something. God has saved me as a result of you preaching the gospel the other day in my room. Don't we sometimes get so laser focused and try to have somebody on our radar, you, just, here's the gospel, repent and believe, repent and believe, and we have no idea what's going on out here or around us. Now, this girl was on his radar, but for God, his sister was on his. You see, we can talk all the gospel we want to and just hope and hope and hope and think that we're going to save somebody or hope to see somebody saved, but God is going to give the faith to whom he wills. That man was floored. He was like, what? My sister was actually listening? Some of y'all wonder, why do, you, why do we have kids in here? Why do we have kids in here? Sometimes they're crying and they're moving and they're distracting We planned this before the, <laughs> me and Caroline got together, planned this. Sometimes they're just all over the place. Sometimes y'all are like, I'm so sorry my kid was loud. I'm like, you have a kid? I don't hear it. 
But here's why. Because the gospel that is teach and, or taught, teach, taught from this pulpit, you may have heard it a thousand times, but those kids that are rustling around and acting like they're not hearing or ignoring everything that's being said, you never know what God is going to use and when he's going to use it to save one of these children in here. And these children, they're seeing their fathers and their mothers sing these biblical truths back to him. They're seeing their fathers and mothers opening their Bible, being in prayer. And I can see right now kids that are leaning in this morning. I see kids right now with their Bibles open, paying attention. This is why we have kids in our service. Because we never know which one of them God will save next. Amen? So we never know who God is going to save at all. It may be somebody that has professed Christ for 30 years that the Holy Spirit finally breaks down and they respond, I've not been a true believer. We never know. But God does. And listen, in your witnessing, in your teaching the gospel, this should bring you great comfort that all you have to do is open your mouth and proclaim the truths of God's word and teach the gospel and let him do the rest. We could worry ourselves to death thinking, oh my gosh, they didn't get saved today, but they heard the gospel. It may be three or four days later like this girl where she says, remember when you were preaching the gospel the other day? Yeah, God used that, saved me, I've been made new. We don't have to save people. We just be obedient to the Great Commission and go out and open our mouths, proclaim the truth, and let God save whom He wills and give the gift of faith to whoever He wants to. Here's our scripture that backs this claim up. And it teaches us that everyone that's been saved from the beginning till Jesus comes back will be saved the same way. And it's a passage that you've heard here, I know, a thousand times at least. Some of you could quote it. You already know what I'm going to say, don't you? By grace, through faith. This is how you've all been saved if you're saved this morning. You've been saved by grace, through faith. And listen to this, this phrase. It's tucked in here nicely. It says, this this grace that you've received, this faith you have, this is not of yourselves. And look what it says next. I think Joe just put it up there. It is the gift of, y'all help me out, God. It is the gift of God. Sometimes we can look at these deep truths that we find in Scripture and we can just kind of skim over them really quickly. But if we, if we dial back and we start to dig down deeper into these Scriptures, you see, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And then that one phrase right there is key. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God. That's why when we preach the gospel... God, do what you will. We just got to keep preaching the gospel and let God do, do what he wants to do. We've seen the object of our faith. We've seen the source or the author of faith. Now this third part of the nature of our faith is the effects of faith. In other words, now what? If we have faith... What should our lives look like now that we have faith in Christ? John tells us that our faith should produce in us obedience and love. John writes in verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. Unfortunately, many Christians for a long, long time now have divorced this idea of obedience and love, and we've tried to justify our disobedience. We've tried to make excuses for our disobedience. We've tried to blame others for our disobedience. We've tried to blame Satan himself for our disobedience. The Bible teaches us that we can't do that, by the way. So if your spouse says, why'd you do this? You can't say the devil made me do it. 
Bible says you've given in to your own desires. So we have seen this divorce from Christianity of obedience, and we've lived disobedience justifying it, and we've divorced Christian love from what it's supposed to be because we don't want to love people that are different from us. We don't want to love people that don't look like us, talk like us, act like us. We don't want to love people that talk about us. We, we don't want to love people that make fun of us. We don't want to love people that hate us. We don't want to love our enemies. Again, we try to justify every reason why we shouldn't do these things. Yet, the Bible teaches us that the faith that we possess as Christians should lead us to obedience to his word and love to our brother. And not even our brother, the Bible goes on to say, this is why we have to read the totality of Scripture. The Bible tells us that we even love our enemies. How many of us are just can't wait to go love our enemies? Now, if you have an enemy, I don't, you don't necessarily have to go up to them and say, I love you. But you know how you love your enemies in a, a practical way? Pray for them. Pray for them. Y'all, just like me, have people that don't like you, right? Pray for those people. Pray for them. And not, listen, I know we've read the Psalms and we're, we're reading where David's like, kick their teeth down the back of their throat. Like, David prays some crazy things, doesn't he, about his enemies. Some of you would like to pray, God, kick their teeth through the back of their head. But I would say this, pray for their good. Pray for their salvation. And if they're saved, pray for their sanctification. Because we want, like I said, we want to divorce this. We want to harbor anger and bitterness. Let me tell you something. I've lived like that for years. And I realized it didn't help me at all. I get upset with people just like y'all do. But when we harbor that and we just don't let it go and we don't pray for the situation, we don't pray for the people that are involved, then it harbors bitterness. And that's sinful. Because the Bible doesn't teach us to harbor. It teaches us to love. It teaches us to pray for one another. To care for one another. Even our enemies. So obviously, I say that we want to divorce these things, but even if we try our best to be obedient and to love like Christ has called us to love, we still fall short, don't we? Last week, the kids up here learned this. If you adults are paying attention too, it's a great time for us to even learn. And I don't know how exactly how it was worded, but can we keep the law of God perfectly? The short answer is no, but I love the way the Westminster Shorter Catechism has put it. And question number 82 says this, Is any man able perfectly to keep the commandments of God? Oh, we would say no, but I love what their answer is here. It says, No mere man since the fall is able in his life perfectly to keep the commandments of God. And they add this to it, but daily breaks them in thought, word, and deed. So even in our thought process, our thinking, we, we are disobedient. Some of the things that we say, we're disobedient. Some of the things that we do, we're disobedient. Now, when John calls us to keep his commandments, is John calling us to this perfect way of living? You have to keep it 100%. There should be no sin among you. No, John's not saying that we have to live perfect lives because we know that we can't live perfect lives because we live in this already not yet where we still live under a fallen world and in a fallen world, a broken world, that we are still sinful and we're saints simultaneously if you're in Christ. So we're still going to sin until Jesus comes back, so we're not going to be able to keep the law of God perfectly. So that's not what John is calling us to do here. John's talking about our desires after our spiritual birth 
living in a new covenant or under the new covenant. You see, when we're saved or born again, God gives us new desires. And if you don't have new desires, then I would say by the word of God that you're not saved. You could be living in a season of sin right now, but if your desire is to live a godly life, if your desire is to read and study his word, then God has put that in you. But if you're in a season of sin and you have no care for the things of God, his word or his church or anything, then you're not saved. So a desire doesn't mean absolutely perfect. But if you have that desire, the want to, the will, that you want to be where God wants you to be and do the things that God wants you to do, He's given you the desire to be obedient to His commands. So it's not talking about living perfectly, but striving. Purposefully trying to be obedient to the Lord and His law and to love one another. And when we fall... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. And although we don't perfectly keep the commandments and we don't perfectly keep his law, John says we have victory over the world. Now think about this just for a minute. Y'all know you, right? You know you pre-Christ and post-Christ. I've heard some of your stories I've known who you were before you were saved and after you were saved. And even now, as saved people, still fallen. We still sin, right? When I think about me and I have victory over the world, that's only by the grace of God. If you think about your own life, it's like, how could I have victory over this world? It's by the grace of God. We have victory over sin. It no longer has dominion over us, as Paul says in Romans 6, 14. Yes, we may allow it to come into our lives. We may give in to our fleshly desires at times. But it cannot have dominion over us as believers. We belong to Christ. We don't belong to the world. We don't belong to Satan. John says everyone who has been born of God, everyone who is a Christian, everyone that possesses this saving faith has overcome the world. Not just anybody has overcome the world, but those that are in Christ has overcome the world and they have the victory. It's because of this faith that we have that John says makes us victorious over the world, over God's enemies, the loveless in the world, the devil, and the devil's deceivers. And as Christians, we're not fighting for victory. I've heard a song before that says, I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. I don't even know who sings it, but I can tell you, the victory is ours if you're in Christ. If you're in Christ, you've seen it. You're not waiting on it. You're not looking for it. You're not one day hoping to see it. You have victory in Christ Jesus alone. And listen, this victory that you have, this victory that I have, is not of myself. It's because of what Jesus did on the cross. It's Jesus that gives us the victory. When we place our faith in Christ, we receive it. That sin has no dominion. Death, where is your sting? We stand victorious because of Christ. Why? Because it's God who gives us the faith to believe in him to begin with. If we were able to believe in Christ on our own, guess what? We have given ourselves a victory. But the last time I checked, none of you went to the cross, had your blood shed, and died for me or yourself. Praise God, it's all for his glory. 
It's only through Christ alone that we have this victory. He has crushed the enemy. And all who war against God have been disarmed and believers stand in this victory. Listen to this beautiful song, the lyrics. I've pulled out one verse. Many of you know the song, In Christ Alone. It's going to be hard not to sing it, so y'all bear with me. There in the ground his body lay. It's over at this point, right? Death, buried, done. Light of the world by darkness slain. But wait. Then bursting forth. Anybody got those chill bumps yet? Then bursting forth. Not just pleasantly coming forth, but bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he arose again. Here it is. And as he stands in victory. Y'all know the next line? Sin's curse has lost its grip on me. Praise God. Yes. For I am his and he is mine. Bought with the precious blood of Christ. Remember the old hymn, Victory in Jesus, he bought me and he sought me with his redeeming love. As Christ has victory, so do his followers have victory. How beautiful it is that God gives us faith in Christ that leads to obedience and love. Without faith, again, we'd all be hostile to God, still at war with God, destined for hell, with no hope whatsoever. Verse 5 tells us that it's those who believe in Jesus that have hope, as well as this victory over the world. Then John moves into a difficult text to understand in verse 6, still talking about this Christ of whom has brought forth the victory for all those that will believe. When he talks about this Christ, it has come by blood and water. Now, there are three main views that look to this. And one view says that John is talking about the baptism of Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus, which sounds pretty good, right? But if we look in context, we don't see John talking about the baptism of Jesus. So for him to just suddenly pull it in and the crucifixion just kind of doesn't fit in our context. Another view says that John is referring to the sacraments which is baptism and the Lord's Supper. Of course we know baptism, profession of faith, the Lord's Supper, uh, the, the bread is the broken body of Christ, the wine or grape juice <laughs> is uh, the shed blood of Christ. But again John doesn't discuss the sacraments in either this epistle or the gospel. So why insert those things here? And what others believe, and what I personally believe that he's referring to here, when he talks about the blood and water, is the blood and water that flowed from the side of Jesus at his death. Because you're going to see how this is going to all come together. Remember they stuck the spear up into him and blood and water flowed. So in this context, we've seen that not only has John been talking about love, 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 he's also been talking about believing on this Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, this whole book opens up with an eyewitness testimony of Christ, the one we've seen, the one we've talked to, the one we've touched with our hands. We're talking about the resurrected Christ. So the wound in the side of Jesus where this blood and water flowed that the disciples were able to see afterwards when he resurrected made this resurrection a true resurrection. It gave validity to it. Right? You could go to John chapter 20 verses 24 through 29 and you see where, where Thomas is, unless I touch the scars on his hands and touch the scar on his side. And you see that he was able not only to touch the scar in his hands, 
but he put his hands in the scar where Jesus, the blood and water flowed from his side. This proved the humanity of Jesus, which was under attack in John's time. And it gave assurance of his resurrection. John wants us to believe on this Lord Jesus Christ, this resurrected Christ, and we can't have faith without the death, burial, and resurrection. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that if Christ didn't raise from the grave, then the faith you have is meaningless. It's useless. So we see that this blood and water in which Jesus came by gives assurance of his resurrection and the testimony of the apostles gives us the, the validity of the resurrection. But John goes on to say that greater than the apostles' testimony, there is still yet a greater testimony. Now, we take the Bible, we believe the apostles, we believe John. We should believe John. We should believe when Thomas felt the scars that it truly indeed happened. Because they walked with him, they talked with him, and we have these passed down that even make these claims legit. When you think about the people that John discipled, and then those people discipled others, so we get these stories. So we have this testimony. More importantly, we have the Word of God to tell us it's true. And that's what John is saying, that yes, we have a great testimony in us, but there's still yet a greater testimony, and that's the testimony about God. That's the testimony that God has for himself. Now, you can tell me all day something, but if that thing you're telling me about starts testifying, then I'm going to believe it even more so. Don't you know that God testifies about himself, about his son? We read it in his word. Great! Yes, tell me everything you know, John. Tell me everything you know, Thomas. But I want to hear from God. There's an old song that our former pastor used to sing and talked about getting to heaven and he saw Timothy and Abraham and Isaac and he said, but Isaac, I want to see Jesus. Right? Now, I don't know how theologically accurate that song is, but it's a beautiful reminder of us that we want to see and hear from Christ. We want to hear from God. We want to hear from His Word. What does God say about Himself? That is the greatest testimony. The Spirit of God will lead those that are saved into this knowledge of Christ and ultimately reveal to them the gift of faith. And from that faith, the Holy Spirit indwells the believer who continues to testify of not only the humanity of Jesus, but the divinity of Jesus and who he is in our lives. You see, the Spirit even testifies to us today about who God is, who Christ is. It's the Spirit of God within us that has revealed to us that, yes, indeed, the Messiah is the one who put on flesh and came to this world, truly God, truly man. See, we can't say that unless the Spirit testifies on, on, on about Jesus and reveals that to us, right? That's why some people have that all wrong, because... They haven't believed the testimony about himself. They deny that Jesus took on flesh. They deny the virgin birth. They deny all the essential truths that we should believe as Christians. They deny these things because the Spirit has yet to reveal it to them. And they have rejected what God has said about himself. And Romans chapter 1 teaches us that mere man has rejected who God is. And no man is without excuse. The Bible is clear. God testifies about himself in creation, his invisible attributes, yet the Bible teaches that man has suppressed this truth. They've denied or rejected the testimony of God, which leads them to deny things and reject things like the virgin birth, the, in, the, the incarnation, all these things. But for a believer, the Holy Spirit will keep us. He'll hold us fast until we draw our last breath. John teaches us that those that reject the testimony of God concerning Christ, they do not have peace, and they do not have faith, and they make God a liar because 
they don't believe him to be who he says he is. And church, I know you know this, but when it comes to the testimony of Christ, eternity is at stake. John reminds us of this. Eternity is at stake. Verse 11 tells us that the testimony God gives us is eternal life, a life spent with Him forever. But a rejection of Christ, a suppressing of the truth, a turning from who God says His Son is, doesn't have the same fate as a believer. Although it will be for an eternity, it will be an eternity in hell because of a rejection of who Christ is. Those that believe on the Lord Jesus will have life, a life that ends with only one death, and that's physical. We're all going to die here. It is appointed for man to die once after this, judgment. For those in Christ, you hear, well done, my good and faithful servant, and you spiritually live forever with the Lord. But those that reject Christ will die twice, the physical death that everyone will die, and after this judgment, a spiritual death which is the worst, worst death where you are no longer or you've never been spiritually alive because God is clear that He makes alive what is dead in Ephesians 2. So you're going to die once and you're already going to be dead spiritually but you're going to be ultimately it's going to be shored up in that moment. You'll never have another chance ever again for as long as you live. You are dead, sealed, done cast into utter darkness where the flame and worm according to the King James Version dieth not that's a sad reality but it's a true reality those of you in here this morning as I'm beginning to close you that are believers you are believers by God's grace as he's given you the gift of faith to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Again, the object of our faith. And it's from that faith that we are able to love God, love others, and have an abundant life. But if you're in here and have rejected Christ, you aren't a Christian. And eternity awaits. An eternity of hell awaits unless you repent of your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart, matter of fact, let's just read it. We read it all the time. Romans 10, 9 and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. It is my prayer this morning that the Holy Spirit will begin to convict of sin, begin to change hearts, reveal your need for a Savior, and that you would repent of your sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ today. Let's stand. Father, we are thankful for your word. We are thankful that we are able to gather here together this morning to sing your word, to open your word, to hear your word, to fellowship with one another, to give. And God, all, all of that is wonderful, and I, I'm so thankful for it. And it's all because of you we're allowed to do these things and give you glory in all things. And Right now, God, I just pray that if there is someone in here that is not saved, that doesn't have true saving faith, that you would begin right now to convict them Reveal to them their need for a Savior. Father, I pray that whether it's today or a few days from now, they would repent, confess their sin to you, seek forgiveness for that sin, turn from their sinful lifestyle and put their faith in your Son, Jesus. Father, your word has gone forth. It says it shall not return void.